George A. Romero was a great American artist. From his earliest roots as an industrial filmmaker to his rise as a popular entertainer, Romero's work was always distinguished by a strong work ethic, an independent mindset, and a firm commitment to contemporary subtextual themes. His unusual style and rebellious countercultural attitude never quite found a place in the larger industry, but Romero brought a distinct intelligence and personality to a variety of genre efforts, creating movies of humor and irony that told genuinely disturbing stories of human failing and social commentary. His films took a sharp scalpel to the values of middle-class America in the late 20th century, and they remain some of the most incisive portraits of their time. Romero's name, however, will forever be linked to the birth of the modern zombie genre, which permanently altered the tradition of the horror film. His versatile monsters have been adopted to an increasing medley of purposes by storytellers the world over, in mediums ranging beyond film into comic books, television, literature, and video games. One of the most significant appropriations of Romero's innovation was the widely influential Resident Evil series, largely responsible for popularizing the survival horror genre. The games drew interest in a film adaptation almost immediately, and during the long five-year struggle to make this a reality, several directors grappled with the challenges of translating its story and gameplay into a cinematic form, among them the paternal icon himself, George Romero. When a Japanese video game company called Capcom released their new horror game, Biohazard, for the original PlayStation system in 1996, there was a great deal of doubt. The game had gone through three years of development and was reconceptualized several times. It began as a remake of the Famicom game Sweet Home, a prototype survival horror piece adapted from a film of the same name, noteworthy as an early effort by director Kiyoshi Kurosawa, who later rose to international prominence in 2001 with a terrifying pulse. The project was eventually handed over to an up-and-coming designer named Shinji Mikami, whose previous Disney-licensed titles had done well for the company. Mikami, influenced by zombie cinema and especially the work of George Romero, started making changes. He moved the developing game away from its supernatural origins, switched the perspective from first person to third person, and utilized full motion video to create an enhanced feeling of realism and immediacy. No one really expected it to hit as big as it did. The game flew off the shelves in Japan, and after it was localized for Western players, retitled Resident Evil, it sold equally well in North America and the UK. Critically acclaimed and controversial for its frightening atmosphere and visceral intensity, it was seen as a breakthrough in gaming, becoming the best-selling PlayStation title of its day. By January 1997, a production company had purchased the screen rights to the game. It wasn't anyone in Hollywood that spotted the potential. Rather, it was a German outfit, Constantine Film, that seized the opportunity. This might seem unusual, if not for the fact that Constantine Film is among the biggest and most successful German production companies of the last few decades. The studio had hit its commercial stride in the 1980s under the management of Bernd Eichinger. Eichinger, in addition to fostering major German talents like Wolfgang Petersen and Uli Edel, was an ambitious producer eager to take on Hollywood with enormous German productions designed for an international market. In films like The NeverEnding Story, in the name of the Rose, he strove to, and succeeded, in proving that Europeans were equally capable of producing work as fantastic and extravagant as anything being made in America. Later, he earned Oscar nominations with arresting dramas like Downfall and the Bader-Meinhof Complex. 
Eichinger was arguably gunning for the American market even more heavily in the 90s, financing period dramas, slapstick comedies, and an adaptation of Marvel's Fantastic Four, co-produced with Roger Corman, that ultimately went unreleased. Resident Evil seems to have been taken on as part of this general trend towards properties with an inherent appeal to American audiences. The first person hired to work on the film was writer Alan B. McElroy. McElroy started his screenwriting career in the late 80s, working on the fourth entry in the Halloween franchise. Over the years, he has written for film, television, video games, and comic books. At the time of his hiring on Resident Evil, he would have just completed work on his highest profile job yet, co-writing the screen adaptation of Todd McFarlane's Spawn, a comic series for which he had previously penned stories. In May 1998, details of his Resident Evil script were leaked to PlayStation Magazine. In an article published on ain'titcool.com, not only is Romero's rumored connection to the film already being mentioned, we are provided also with a complete synopsis of McElroy's screenplay. Aside from minor alterations, it sounds very similar to the original game. In the first Resident Evil, players took control of either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, members of the Special Operations STARS unit sent to investigate mysterious occurrences outside Raccoon City. After being attacked by mutant dogs, the team holes up in a seemingly abandoned mansion, which turns out to be a secret lab run by the Sinister Umbrella Corporation. The lab was being used to develop a devastating biological weapon called the T-Virus, which ran out of control and is now escaping. Players must solve puzzles, battle zombies, mutated sharks, snakes, and plants before defeating the villainous double agent Wesker by destroying Umbrella's ultimate experiment, a grotesque super soldier dubbed Tyrant, and escaping before the lab self-destructs. In McElroy's script, the story focuses on a similar elite government team, which may or may not be stars sent to break into a laboratory located in Raccoon Forest, where recently a SWAT unit investigating reports of strange creatures has disappeared. Upon arrival, the team is attacked by mutant dogs and finds refuge in a strange mansion, which turns out to be the secret lab. There, they battle zombies, giant wasps and spiders, and other results of experiments gone horribly wrong. Eventually, they discover the whole thing was a setup, meant to provide subjects to infect with the menacing T-Virus, though there's no mention here of the Umbrella Corporation. At the end, Jill and Chris, the two remaining survivors, fight off the tyrant, which turns out to be an infected Wesker, destroy the lab, and escape with the antidote. When McElroy's script was apparently deemed unsatisfactory, the production turned to another writer, who, in an added bonus, could act also as the film's director, horror legend, George Romero. Resident Evil came along at a very strange time in Romero's career. He had risen in total independence with the success of midnight hits like Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, movies which gave birth to the modern iteration of the zombie. He'd founded his own company, independently financed movies for distribution by major studios, and in general, tried to maintain a healthy distance from Hollywood. All that changed in the 80s. Studios were getting bigger, movies were getting more expensive to make, and small companies like his were finding it harder to survive. After disagreements with his producer, Romero left his company to, for the first time, find work as a director for hire on studio projects. The results were good, as can be seen in the bizarre yet suspenseful Monkey Shines and the intelligent and underrated Stephen King adaptation, The Dark Half. But the adjustment to his new environment was challenging. Creative control was difficult to maintain, the ending to Monkey Shines was changed against his wishes, and disaster could spring from any direction, like when Romero's distributor, Orion Pictures, went bankrupt, which left his movie, The Dark Half, sitting on a shelf for almost two years. In the 90s, Romero didn't fare much better. For basically the entire decade, he would become involved in a succession of major projects that all became lost in development hell. 
Among them was a ghost story titled Before I Wake, and a reboot of Universal's The Mummy. This latter film actually came quite close to being made, even getting a green light from the studio before it was undone by contractual issues. Director Steven Summers later took the project over and filmed it as a big, fun, fairly straightforward action adventure, highly imitative of the Indiana Jones films, and a long ways off from Romero's plan to make it a more modest, classical horror piece. With feature films proving almost impossible to get off the ground, Romero struggled to find work. He filmed half of an Edgar Allan Poe diptych with Dario Argento called Two Evil Eyes in 1990, and in 1998 directed a pilot for a show called Iron City Ass Kickers that was never aired. One of the other jobs Romero took that year was filming a live-action promotional spot for Capcom's newly released Resident Evil 2. The spot, fast-paced and stylized, featured young, up-and-coming American actors Brad Renfro and Adrian Franz, with makeup effects by Screaming Mad George, the artist behind the unforgettably freakish effects for Brian Usna's Society. When Romero made this promotional short, which wound up airing only in Japan, he hadn't been able to direct a film in nearly 10 years. What happened next is a little hazy. Several articles report that Romero was directly hired onto the Resident Evil movie by Capcom and Sony, but this appears to be inconsistent with information available elsewhere. Capcom doesn't seem to have been directly supervising the production, and Sony doesn't appear to have become involved until 2001, when they picked up the completed film for distribution. The presence of these larger corporations in reports on the film's history is probably a mistake, done in an effort to give the narrative a more dramatic, independent artist versus major studio angle. The truth appears to be more complicated. Romero himself mentions working directly with Constantine Films in an interview included in the book George Romero Interviews, and one article by Luke Owen titled The George A. Romero Resident Evil Movie We Never Got to See, contains many more consistent details and sources than the others, which match up with Romero's account. So I'm going with the information presented here as a more accurate representation of the facts. Eichinger apparently saw Romero's commercial, and, struck by its atmosphere, so reminiscent of the games, he decided to reach out. Romero, after accepting the job, was keen to capture even more of the spirit of those games with a feature, despite the fact that he doesn't appear to have ever actually played them himself. To work his way around this, Romero had his secretary play the games and videotape footage of the gameplay. His script, the first draft of which he wrote very quickly, was built around the hours of footage he watched to familiarize himself with the games. This first draft is dated October 7th, 1998. It seems to be the most widely circulated version of Romero's script. He would go on to write anywhere from four to eight additional drafts over approximately another year of development. So this script is likely not an absolute representation of the final form Romero's film would have taken, but it does at least give us an idea. In basic outline, it's very similar to the first game. An elite commando unit called STARS is sent to infiltrate a secret lab underneath an abandoned mansion outside Raccoon City. There they discover the disastrous results of the Umbrella Corporation's efforts to develop a biological weapon called the T-Virus. Battling their way deeper into the facility, led by the duplicitous Wesker, who claims that an antidote lies at the center, they encounter zombie scientists, dogs and sharks, mutated plants and snakes, reptilian creatures called hunters, and eventually the most dangerous of Umbrella's experiments, the Tyrant. When it's revealed that Wesker is really there to rescue data on the Tyrant, allowing Umbrella to manufacture super soldiers, his team turns against him. The survivors destroy the Tyrant and escape the mansion just before it self-destructs, but not in time to contain the outbreak, which has already spread to Raccoon City. Romero's script moves with purpose and momentum, traveling breathlessly from set piece to set piece, 
It's packed with all the familiar iconography of the game, the settings, the monsters, even the color-coded key cards that grant access to the lab's deeper areas, but Romero has also made the material his own. Several key characterizations and narrative motivations have been altered. Chris Redfield, our protagonist, instead of being a STARS officer, is presented as a part Mohawk civilian. He ends up involved in the team's secret mission after he goes searching for his girlfriend, Jill Valentine. She turns out to be an undercover STARS agent, tasked with monitoring the mansion. Later in the script, we also get a surprise appearance by another character, not introduced until the second game, Ada Wong, written here as a scientist who helped develop the T-Virus. Romero uses details and alterations like this as a way of introducing his own stylistic elements. He adds layers of irony, campy humor, political satire, and social commentary. By making the hero Native American and non-military, Romero injects the story with his own anti-authoritarian sentiment. It becomes a dark and cynical critique of American militarism and corporate corruption kind of an expanded version of his 1973 thriller, The Crazies. True to form, Romero delivered his messages through an abundance of pulpy thrills. His Resident Evil would have had no shortage of blood and gore. Nearly every scene features someone or something meeting a creatively gruesome end. In fact, his script was so overloaded with carnage that it appears to have caused some hesitancy at Constantine Films. Romero had pushed up against the boundaries of the American rating system before. His previous films Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead had both been released unrated. They were noted at the time for their extremely graphic violence. Romero was able to get away with this by keeping his films limited to very low budgets. That way, the resulting ratings controversy couldn't hurt their box office potential too much. Resident Evil was going to be much higher budgeted, with mainstream appeal as a primary concern. An unrated release, or an NC-17, would have been too prohibitive for a film of this size. Even so, Romero was apparently optimistic about his chances. He claims there was a very positive reception to his script, and after working on several more drafts, he expected the project to receive a green light. As it turned out, Romero was in for an unpleasant surprise. According to him, the project's producer, by which he probably means Bernd Eichinger, told him flat out he just couldn't make a movie like this. The project lingered in uncertainty. Romero was let go sometime in late 1999 or early 2000, and Constantine Films had trouble finding a replacement. Stephen Norrington, director of Blade, and emerging slasher filmmaker Jamie Blanks were two of the names allegedly considered. According to Luke Owen, at that point, the film started losing momentum, and probably would have been cancelled altogether if not for the efforts of Paul W.S. Anderson. Anderson, a British filmmaker who started his career in television, worked his way to Hollywood quickly. After making only a single film in the UK, a punk-themed sci-fi action movie called Shopping, a solid debut that remains his best movie. His first studio assignment was also his first video game adaptation, the 1995 big-screen version of Midway's notoriously violent fighting game Mortal Kombat. Produced for less than $20 million, a mere fraction of what effects blockbusters were costing at the time, Anderson delivered something impressive and unexpected. Instead of a mindless bloodbath, his Mortal Kombat was an atmospheric visual feast, bringing to life the game's larger ideas of other worlds and supernatural forces. Reviews were mixed, but the film was a hit. Anderson had established himself. Unfortunately, he wouldn't live up to the promise of his early career. After directing two box office flops in a row, he was in need of a project that would turn his luck around. A fan of the games, the possibility of making a movie out of Resident Evil excited him. Constantine Films was not so sure. A lot of money had already been spent developing the film, and they didn't want the additional expense of ordering another screenplay, so Anderson offered to write it on spec. 
Writing on spec basically means the screenplay is written for free. When the studio reads the finished screenplay, they can decide then whether or not they want to pay for it. Anderson was taking a chance, but he made sure to cover his bet. Instead of writing something too close to the games, he wrote an original script titled Undead, which merely borrowed elements from them. That way, if Constantine Films bought it, they could simply retitle it Resident Evil. If not, he could take it somewhere else and make his own movie out of it. This explains why his eventual adaptation seems to bear so little resemblance to the games. There are a few recognizable elements. The zombies and monsters, the abandoned mansion, the underground facility, but the connection to the source material is mostly incidental. Anderson's film centers on a new character named Alice, trying to recover her memories while helping a commando team contain a T-virus outbreak in a secret lab called The Hive. Bordering on the incomprehensible, the story follows Alice as she uncovers her memories, confronts a murderous AI called the Red Queen, and battles a wildly convoluted conspiracy revolving around the Umbrella Corporation. Constantine Films seems to have liked this script, because of course, it was the one that got made. Resident Evil was finally released in 2002. The finished movie is action-heavy, without the enjoyable variety of Romero's script, and Anderson seems to have struggled with the budget. It doesn't look as polished as his earlier work. In spite of a committed performance by Mili Jovovich, it's mostly a forgettable film, derivative and uninvolving, containing one or two well-directed sequences. The film was critically panned, yet very financially profitable, spawning a whole series of its own. Romero retreated from studio filmmaking entirely, fed up with its capricious attitudes. He settled in Toronto, Canada, and there managed to revive his filmmaking career. I don't know if it would have been a masterpiece, but Romero's Resident Evil did appear to have plenty of potential. What's most intriguing about it is that it definitely could have sent the director's career on a very different trajectory. As it is, I'm glad to have the films that Romero did manage to make. His long-awaited return to the genre he pioneered in 2005's Land of the Dead may have even borrowed somewhat from his larger-scale ambitions on Resident Evil. With this film, he was arguably at more of an advantage. He didn't have to worry so much about ratings restrictions, since, with the advent of DVD, he could easily release an unrated director's cut, and by writing an original story, he was able to lean much further in to his flair for social commentary. Although Romero's adaptation never made it through to completion, Resident Evil's presence in the popular imagination owes a tremendous debt to his influence. It is thanks to his highly original and still unmatched contributions that we even have this genre in the first place. <laughs>